first of all, thanks for uh, this invitation. I really enjoy being here and uh, I work very hard. I'm still working very hard, so it's a nice place for me to work. <laughs> Actually, I manage also to put my children. I have four children in some schools, so it was much better than what I expected. So the, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the topic is uh, on PDEs, but at the end is something related to measure theory because uh, I'm going to explain what the title mean, what means, and uh, okay, I hope you like. So I, this is in collaboration with my student, Elio Marconi, which is here in the audience. <coughs> okay, so let's forget about it. So let me say what is the problem. The problem is, uh, well, if you have a conservation law, well, it's, it's a textbook uh, result to show that you don't have uniqueness and you need some uh, additional constraints. And the typical constraint is uh, the dissipation of any entropy, the equation or the system as depending on the case. In scalar, for scalar equations, okay, you have a lot of entropies and in fact, they, they are sufficient to prove uniqueness. So for mathematician that prefers convex function to concave, at least, <laughs> so uh, an entropy is uh, a, a convex function and so an entropy doesn't matter, it's just a function, but a convex entropy is something that when applied to the, the solution of this PDE and using the chain rule which is given here for at least a smooth solution, you have zero, but for solution which are whatever you want, distributional solution, you get that this distribution as a sign. So in other words, because as a sign, this is a negative measure. So the entropy is dissipating. And this is the dissipation of entropy. So the idea that if there are several reasons why you need a sign here, or you prefer to have a sign here. And the, the typically, the, one of, I think, the main argument is that if you assume that your solution here comes from uh, some approximation, so, well, some a more complicated system, which has some uh, uh, microscopic uh, structures. So for example, you have a viscosity. And then uh, the scaling which leaves uh, the equation invariant is the, the, the scaling with what you get an epsilon in front of the viscosity. And well, you do the same computation for multiplying by eta, and then you get, uh, well, the chain rule here. But when you apply eta to the, the viscosity uxx, you get something which is sorry, something which is uh, zero, which is this term going to zero in distribution, but you get the second derivative. So okay, maybe I'm not explaining very well, but essentially, when you apply eta prime of u to the equation u t plus f prime of u u x minus u x x, right? This guy here is just a chain rule. So eta prime f prime is equal to q prime. So it's zero. Well, it's a dis it's distributional sense is okay. And then you want to write this guy here like a second derivative, but clearly you get the second derivative of eta second time ux squared. So if this convex, this is a sign. And so you're happy because uh, it means that this quantity here, which converges in distribution just to this side, is negative. Okay, and then you say, okay, the, uh, all the solution that I want to select, they have to satisfy this additional constraint or these additional constraints depending on the case. <coughs> and in fact, uh, well, now we are interested in the structure of this measure. And then I'm going to tell you why, where the, this problem comes from. So, oh gosh. so the first thing is that if U is smooth, it's just a, a textbook, well, it's just first year course to prove that it's zero, simply because you apply the chain rule for Q prime, which is this relation over here. You collect the terms and you get again the equation, which is zero by definition being a solution. Now start something more complicated, which is BV. So for BV, BV you can st you have still a chain rule, which is the Volper rule. Here is written in a little bit in a more complicated setting. But essentially the Volper rule tells you that the continuous part of the derivative. So for BV, you know that if u is BV, it's exactly equal to say that Okay, we forget, u will be in an infinity, so just write the condition in the derivative. The distributional gradient of u is a measure, locally bounded measure, depending on what you want. And then the Volper rule tells you that also for any, let's say, eta, also eta of u is in BV. And so you know that the derivative of eta 
is a measure, and this allows you to compute what is this thing. And okay, the formula is that the eta is eta prime of u times the continuous part of u. So being a measure, you have some part which is uh, which does not give uh, any measure to sets which are small, and then you have uh, some the jump part which is the in some sense the most uh, is the discontinuity part of u plus and then is the jump let's say eta u plus minus eta u minus some overall jumps so this is in 1d in multi d uh, in our case is in 2d well the jump is uh, contr is controlled by a sum over lipschitz curves so you have uh, the two traces the plus and the minus and uh, it turns out that when you apply the rule here to this uh, distributional form, you get this guy over here, which is zero, simply because uh, this equation implies that the continuous part is zero. The jump part, you get this relation, which is uh, the rankine ugonio condition, so it means the conservation. So whatever transit from one side should exit from the other side. And uh, instead, in for the entropy, you get another relation but in any case, the important thing is that uh, the term, which is not zero, is not this guy, is just uh, the jump part. So essentially, this is uh, what I mean by concentration. So we will say that the dissipation of entropy is concentrated if it is uh, concentrated on countably many Lipschitz curves. So let me make a picture here. So a priori, if, I, if you take the plane, you know just that and this distributional form less or equal than zero, so it is a measure that you don't know where it is. It can be wherever you want, a priori. In fact, the problem is that you have to add also the other equation. And uh, I say that it, is, it has concentrated it. Instead of having this picture, you have a much nicer picture. So you have some curves. And uh, the entropy is just concentrated on those curves. Let me say that uh, this is uh, really is not the worst case; it's the best case because the equation is invariant by the the, the sorry. This is a self-similar scaling, and this condition is exactly invariant for the same se se the self-similar scaling. So all the continuous part of the divergence will disappear if you just scale t to alpha t and x to alpha x. And then just this part survives. So it's the natural case of the equation. OK, I hope this is clear what I mean by concentration. And uh, so now why, why the conjecture comes from? The con well, there are several. Uh, I'm, I'm telling just one where, uh, how they tell me the conjecture. But is in the literature or in several forms it's present. So the conjecture is the following. So it is related to a model for uh, um, you need to, to know uh, the speed of convergence of uh, uh, a kinetic model with uh, a stochastic model to one dimensional Burger equation, which is this special case. And uh, you know just that one entropy, which is this special entropy, is a, is a signed measure. Not, uh, you don't require to be negative, just as a measure. And now uh, they want to know if it is concentrated, because in that case they can compute, uh, uh, they, they can prove what is the gamma limit of some functional, and this functional gives you, okay, they know better than me, but it gives you the speed of convergence of these approximations. Okay, so concentration means, as I said, that you can find countably many curves, the purple here, and uh, you know that this distribution is just some measure along the curve. And the measure is exactly, well, h1, so the length. And this is because the vector field is in L infinity, and it cannot see any sh anything sharper than h1. OK. So this is the conjecture. However, <laughs> I cannot solve it, so we prove something else, of course. <laughs> so let me start before what was known in the literature. So the first case is in the case when the flux is convex and concave. So it's, and it's exactly this case, but the only requirement is that now the measure is negative. So 
In that case, it's much easier because uh, uh, you know by several works that essentially the solution is BV for any positive time because you have these decay estimates. So the positive part of the derivative is bounded by a measure, in this case is a 1 over T L1. And then it means that this guy here is a measure and then you deduce that U is BV and then you apply the same chain rule. In multi-D, it's clearly more complicated. And as, a, as you see, that the conjecture is presented in cell also in multi-D, no? can be stated in independent of the dimension. So in this case, what we know is, that is essentially that uh, you can select a rectifiable set, which replaces the core with some Lipschitz D-dimensional surface. And it turns out that at least one part of the dissipation is over there. But So I'm saying that. The jump part of the dissipation, so the sharpest one, the less regular one, is along surfaces, but you don't say anything about the rest. So it can be some other part. And finally, there is a result in the case when f is, has some regularity, in this case, there are finitely many inflection points. So it's like something like close to this guy, but you don't have this estimate here in that case. But still, uh, something similar can apply. And in fact, what you obtain is that not U is BV, but uh, essentially the characteristic speed, which is the, the, the derivative of the flux, is in BV. And there are some additional condition, uh, but in any case, the result is that the jump where the characteristic speed jumps, you get, uh, you select those curves. Being BV, you have at least a, a way to find the curves. Okay. So the problem is that, okay, you can forget about the picture, but the problem is that in general is not true. And this was an example. Okay, so you have infinitely many inflection points, clearly, otherwise the result would be correct. And, uh, okay, you just take a model set, you prove that for this model set, the parameter, one of the parameter converges, the other not, you, you, piled, you piece them together, at the end you get that F prime is not BP. Okay, this is not uh, interesting. So, okay, so uh, I think this part uh, is better to understand with the picture. So one of the main things that you have uh, in uh, 1D, I think, is the fact that uh, you can use the method of characteristics. However, for uh, the method of characteristics is okay, and so the method of characteristics means that, so you take again your equation, so which is ut, f of u x equal to zero, but then, okay, you write in a quasi-linear form, so f prime u x equal to zero, and this is known, it means that u is constant along the curves. So u of u t, let's say, x plus f prime of u, in the same point, t, okay, u t plus f prime of u t, uh, sorry, this clause uh, u f prime, f prime t is equal to zero. So u is constant along straight segments. And the thing is okay until, uh, as the standard example, what happened is that, uh, well, when the characteristic cross, you have to continue in some way the solution. You know that the solution can be continued, but clearly this representation is false. And at the end, what the when the method of characteristic is used is in the case of Burger. So let's say the f second greater than zero, because in that case, what you can prove is that uh, f prime, okay, is uh, uh, semi-convex. So it's monotone, let's say monotone. In that case, there is a good notion of uh, solution of an ODE of, the, of a in, or differential inclusion with the right side, the monotone operator. And it turns out that essentially what it comes out when, when they meet, you just follow the discontinuity of f prime. And essentially, this discontinuity has measure zero. So you recover the solution by just continuing the characteristic from t equal to zero. But clearly, in general, this, this drawing is false because this condition is not, as you said, as I said, is already solved. So the, because you know that u is BV, you don't need anything about uh, the method of characteristic. So uh, what I want to present with this picture is uh, how the policy can be extended. So uh, the idea is that instead of having, uh, so
So instead of, ha oh, sorry. Instead of having s taking the initial data, you forget about the initial data, and you take just a flow x. And one of the things uh, is that uh, the, this flow generated by, in this case, is monotone. So they cannot cross each other. So you require this flow to this monotone. And then you associate to the flow a value, which is not necessarily the initial data. And uh, you say that this value is a good value until some time, which you decide, for example, well, which you, uh, you have to choose at some point. So let's say this value, this red value, so this uh, curve here, stays on the graph of u. Clearly, being a solution u, not, uh, uh, let me say, not a continuous function, so the graph is not a closed set, you have to specify in which sense is uh, valid. And so we can come back. And the sense is the following, is written here. So at the level, so the value of u can be just, or the derivative of u is just the image of the derivative of w, where w is this value here. So you associate the value w, and then uh, this value w is okay until some, some time t. So essentially what you say is that uh, I have a graph and a flow, so I have a graph W. Which depends only on some parameter Y. And the parameter Y is not related to X. Just, a mo uh, just in R. And well, at, some at any time T, I have the map X, T, Y. So this maps, which is a monotone. So W change side, change shape. And I say that uh, the graph of this guy over here is exactly contains the graph of my original U. Okay, so this was done uh, at the beginning, uh, at least for BV, by my former student, Stefano Modena. The definition is very complicated. Another important thing is that actually you can prove that if the solution is BV, the derivative of the flow, so this flow X solves the characteristic equation. So when U is continuous, is the derivative. Otherwise, if you have a jump, you take the speed of the discontinuity. Okay, so at the end, uh, this is the extension of the method of characteristic, at least for BV. So the problem is that uh, uh, for L infinity, you have a, a big problem because uh, if we come back to the formula here. I have to specify W in the set where uh, you see X, now the derivative of X is a measure, but depends on T. And so W should be defined almost everywhere with respect to the family of measure dy xt, which is not a priori, well, can be very bad. You don't know a priori if this, I mean, at the end could be, you, maybe you need to, to have it the, the very, the defined for any time, no? It can happen that, and, and that clearly uh, is not possible to do. I mean, you can show that. It's, so, okay, so the, the idea is to change interpretation. So, let, so the idea is, that, is that to interpret this curve here in another way. And let me take the picture. So, sorry, let's forget about it. So the picture is the following. So this was the original uh, idea. This is just the value of u. On the other hand, I may think of the following. So let's cut the solution only on one side of the curve x, and I give you the value W. So I'm saying I want to solve the, now it's a boundary uh, initial problem, where uh, here I take the initial data, and here I take this value W, which uh, was my, uh, in the Lagrangian representation or before, was the value that I choose. Okay, I can do it on one side, I can do it on the other side. And it turns out the following, that if you take u plus, define u plus as the solution on the right side with that boundary data, or you take u minus with the solution on the left side and you piece them together, you recover the initial condition. So essentially I'm saying that you can do the following operation. So, so I have this I have this curve x and I have a solution, so ut solves ut plus f of u x equal to zero. Then what I can do, I can, on one hand, I can solve u plus minus t, t 
this solves ut plus f of u x equal to zero with the value on gamma is, okay, let's say it is w, gamma plus minus. This solves in uh, x greater than gamma t or less than gamma t. Okay? And if I cut to, let's say, x greater than gamma t or less than gamma t, here I obtain u uh, plus or minus, let's say, which are, let's say, this is with the tilde, and they are the same. Okay? So essentially, I can first, you, I solve the, the whole of uh, PD and then I cut it. Or first I cut and solve, and I get the same thing. Okay, so this is a, a nice structure because uh, it turns out that, uh, <coughs> sorry, it turns out that the following holds that this notion of a boundary is a, is stable for a, a lot of convergence. So in particular, is stable when it is the solution converges in L1, the curves converge in C0, and the boundary data converge. Well, yeah, is in R, essentially. So it turns out that uh, all these notions uh, of convergence, they, are, they leave this uh, picture invariant. And uh, well, this is essentially the convergence in, uh, well, in the product space. So at the end, uh, I can just take, so once I construct this value for a BV, I can take the limit in uh, Kuratowski uh, or, or <coughs> well, the uniform limit, and what I get is a closed compact set of all the values and all the curves such that this picture holds. So gamma is some sort of generalized characteristic in here, if you wish, right? We don't know yet. Yeah, at the end will be. It's true. But at this point, no, because you just require convergence. It's just a boundary value such that this picture holds. Okay. So in fact, what you get is you get a compact set, which is made by three components. So you need the curve gamma, the value w, and the time t. And t is less or equal than some function. And this function is uh, up to which time you can uh, use uh, this curve as a boundary value. And uh, well, as again, uh, the monotonicity is preserved by uniform convergence. This is preserved because of compactness of, uh, of boundary values, admissible binary values. And uh, because of this compactness, also the function would be upper semi-continuous because any limit is inside your set. And uh, now it comes something more delicate, which are uh, how it, this is related to the PD. So one relation is that essentially all your values, well, essentially they have to, they contain all, all the, well, in BV I would say this contain the jump set. In general, what I can say is just uh, if I fix uh, some two values, y, so two curves, the set of admissible values is connected. And the only relation to the PVE, surprisingly, is this relation here, which tells you that the speed in any ball is given by, well, all the possible speed you can have. Okay, so the, the value in some point is the, inter the intersection of all the possible speed you have in any by balls. So this is just because they come from, from a situation where this holds at the beginning. Okay, so the picture is like this one. Essentially, I have the set Y, which parameterizes the curve, the set W, which are some va the values. And uh, for any YW, I say, okay, this is a good value. So Y is, we miss a, a curve gamma Y up to some time T Y. Okay, this is a compact set. This is the hypograph of this upper set continuous one. So the problem is what I do with this thing over here. So, okay, this is the picture essentially in the TX plane of the meaning. So essentially I fix Y, which means I fix this curve. And along this curve I can have two several values, no? Because I'm not saying that there's just one value. In fact, it's not just one value in general. And for example, the red value WY is okay up to this time here. Then something happened. Here is for BV, clearly I cannot draw some L infinity function, so it is just a BV function. And uh, it, this is cancelled, this value is not needed anymore, it's cancelled, and but the green the green value survives for a farther, a little bit farther. And okay, the, the thing is that if I kite over at this time with a green value, I recover the, the solution on both sides. If I cut up to this time, even 
also with the red value I recover the solution. That's uh, the study. Okay, so now once we have the characteristic in some sense, let's call it the characteristic, one of the methods here for the monotone is the maximal and minimal characteristics. So essentially you want to know this point, the value in this point, essentially the domain of dependence. So you say, okay, let me take the maximal characteristic coming from this side and the minimal characteristic coming from that side. Okay, and then I say, okay, this is the domain of dependence essentially and to compute the solution here I need to only to study the, the initial data here or the equation here and do my business depending on the question. Okay, so let, let's repeat it, which is uh, because uh, now I can do it be because X is monotone. No? So I can, for any, if you give me a point, I can define, I can find what is the last characteristic on the left passing through the point, uh, sorry, the maximal characteristic on the right passing through the point, and this is the positive, so the infimum of all characteristics greater than that guy, and uh, the minimum also on the other side. So let's now, I have just to consider the cases. Here it's very easy, it happened that you have just one characteristic and in general you can see for the monotone, they, the picture is like this. You cannot do anything better. Actually, it's very nice. But while here, clearly the situation is more complicated. So the first thing is uh, there may be in that point two characteristics, at least two characteristics. No? The number of characteristics passing through x at time t is greater than one. Well, and now uh, I, I know that maybe I'm confusing you, but uh, let me recover, recall that for BV, it's very easy to, see, to say what is a jump. Because you have the right and left traces, you said the right left traces, st strong right and left traces, they are different, and then you recover this jump set. For L infinity, it's not clear at all what is a jump set. So how do you define a jump set? It can be discontinuous everywhere, no? Okay, so, but the natural thing is, uh, if you look at the picture here, is that the, the fact that this is a discontinuity is exactly that I'm coming from two sides. And since the speed are different, the value of u cannot be the same, because the speed is f prime of u. Okay, so I just say, and this means that two characteristics, they, they join in that point, and so I say, okay, the, my shock set is the set of points such that at least two characteristics pass through that point. The fact that the map uh, is uh, monotone means that uh, if you have two characteristics, there is a small interval. And then it means that uh, you have, if you take a dense set of Y, these uh, countably curves, countably many curves, they cover all this set. So we recover, at least we found countably many curves. Well, another thing is that m while you're approaching from the left, from the right, sorry, at some point, one characteristic touches before. In the case where it is convex, this cannot happen. That's why F prime is monotone. But in the general case, this happened. And in fact, all the troubles are exactly there. So it touches before and then, well, it changes. And now the thing is that inside here, recall, recall that the values along this curve, the blue and the green curve, are some boundaries. So essentially, in some here, I can, the solution is given by solving my PDE, but with this boundary data, this boundary data, and there is no initial data, because at some point they join. And in that case, you can prove that the solution is basically explicit, it's like a Riemann problem, so the, the building block, and actually is monotone, is BV, uh, as all the good thing you expect. In particular for us means that is BV. It is an open BV region and for BV I, I don't I know already that the entropy is this that the entropy dissipation is concentrated. So these regions are I don't need that. And finally the last case is uh, when I'm approaching and I never touch. And uh, this happened the magic is at this point because it turns out that in that case the blue line is a straight line. Okay, we can forget the proof because uh, it's a little bit technical, but let's see the implication. This was, if you remember, is the original picture. Okay, it seems nice, but at the end it can be very complicated because you have, I mean, the flow is not unique in the future and not in the past, nor in the past, and you have bifurcation, you don't know what to do. However, the picture, the true picture is this one. 
So you have these countally many curves, these BV regions, and the rest are straight lines. So the picture is much nicer than what one can expect. Okay, so far so good. So at the end, what, how to prove the conjecture? Okay, countably many curves, I'm okay in the conjecture. If the entropy is over there, it's okay. BV regions, I, well, BV, I can apply the chain rule, so here is still okay. So the only thing is to analyze is what happened on these segments. Okay, the fact is that I can take the balance. No, I, now, now it turns out that uh, uh, what is the play between uh, the dissipation and, uh, and the, the equation. So I, I can make balance along regions of this form for the two equations. So first I have ut. and then the other. Okay, so it's here that the magic happened. Okay, so let's start with, the, with the, 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 the balance of the second equation. So I have the flow on the top minus the flow on the bottom. This epsilon is just because uh, I want the segment to be Lipschitz and is equal to the dissipation inside. This is exactly what the second equation tells us. And what is the result? The fact is that since these segments, they exist from, let's say, 0 to 1, they cannot, uh, the dependence of the speed is Lipschitz. Otherwise, they will cross. No? And so uh, I have that uh, the, de the density of y, so let's say, is the length of this segment as the t changes, is a Lipschitz function, can be computed over here. OK, so we apply this balance. Now we pass to the limit to the first equation, and again, here you have zero, now you pass to the limit, you replace this guy with the density, so change of variable, and you obtain this relation. The derivative of the value of u times the change in density is equal to the derivative of the flow. Okay? This is exactly, uh, so this is the derivative of u times d, sorry, u times d, the value, and this will be the derivative of the flow. And now you have to compute, okay, just you prove first of all that the derivative with respect to t of this guy is zero. And there are two cases. Okay, one case is that, uh, well, we can forget it. In any case, the third is that you can show that this guy is derivative zero. And you recovered the most important formula, which is this chain rule. So let me say what this chain rule is important, because uh, uh, if f is smooth, that is trivial, no? So f u, if u is smooth, lambda u, lambda is f prime of u, u y, you differentiate by standard calculus, get minus f second, so u, u y, u. The, the only thing is that for u l infinity, this is completely uh, nonsense, no? Because I'm computing l infinity times a distribution and, okay, nonsense. However, this guy was lambda, so the, the, my characteristic speed depending on y, and this guy is uh, lambda, the derivative with respect to y of lambda y. And now you see the formula is completely meaningful, and uh, this is exactly the chain rule. So usually in this problem, what is missing is a chain rule. So you need the, the fact that you solve a PDE tells you that u is not uh, just an any L infinity function, but so this satisfies some additional regularity. And actually, it turns out that this is the additional regularity. OK, once you have the chain rule, well, now you reapply to the other, to the entropy. OK, let me forget. And uh, essentially, you get the second chain rule, which is this guy over here. And this, okay, up to some computation. Um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, this is a little bit complicated, but we can, if you want, I can explain. In any case, it turns out that the second chain rule tells you that the measure is just, uh, um, the, um, okay, it's just the jump part of Q. You don't have Cantor part. And the fact that it's a jump part is, in some sense, the, the, the the, 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 so the conjecture which tells you that this value only jumps, and the jumps of Q is exactly, since U is continuous, is exactly the, the measure over here. 
okay? And then, okay, you can count them, it's not important. So at the end, of the, the basic rule, the basic fact is that you are able to prove uh, an additional chain rule and uh, as for the BV case, you can use it, the chain rule to cancel the term you don't need. Okay, so thank you for the attention. So, so uh, context-related question. You said that if you take uh, L-infinity initial data, then you generally don't expect a prime of you to get into BV, and that's part of yeah. the difficulty. Yeah. Uh, can you? Is there any smoothing effect in here? Any regularizing effect that applies to F? Ah, uh, yeah, but it's very subtle. It's uh, subtle because, uh, uh, well, for you have to state in the language of measure. You cannot say immediate. So essentially, it turns out that, uh, well, there are several cases. So. The smoothing is that once you, t you select these curves, so you have countably many curves, which are the curves where something happened. Okay, and now you ask uh, uh, what, how is the solution in this curve? So essentially, in BV, what you know is that if I take a, a point outside this, oh, along each curve, I have the left and right trace in L1. Well, here you cannot say that, but you can say, that uh, the, there exists the left and right trace in each point up to the linear degenerate component of f prime. So let's say these are the components where f second of u is equal to zero. So the connected components of this set. So what happened is that, uh, well, you cannot say what is the limit, but you can say that the limit exists if uh, in the quotient topology. And uh, the u is not BV, but the structure up to this quotient topology is the same, which means that outside this countably many set, you have a t here is a continuity point in this sense, of course, and here you have this, the jump part in that sense. And but if you know the limit in this topology, you are able to reconstruct the speed. So, like for BV, you can con obtain the Rankine Ogonio condition, and essentially is. Uh, you recover very, very the formula very close to the BV setting. The only thing is that uh, to state it is complicated. In fact, I prefer not to. I just <laughs> yeah, it's more complicated. It's not that complicated. It requires some 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 tool. But yes, and there are also some additional things. For example, that well, that you can find uh, in the representation of this boundary more regularity from T positive. Yeah, it depends on the question, of course. Okay, uh, other so questions? Maybe just a question, like, how is this related like, to kinetic formulations? And like ah, uh, well, the, the problem was uh, if uh, one open question is whether uh, this, uh, the right-hand side of the kinetic formulation is not just the derivative of a measure, but is a measure. Yes. And we don't know. Huh? <laughs> We try to prove that it is a measure, but it turns out that it's not so, so clear because, uh, uh, well, clearly you have, uh, once you have this guy over here, you know that the kinetic formulation, because you have the continuity, so let, let's take that these set are just points, so it's a weakly generally nonlinear. So the limits are taken strongly, which means outside is continuous, and then you have the strong traces. Uh, so you know where this measure is going to be concentrated. However, um, still, uh, um, so everything is explicit in some sense, but your bound is just the projection is a measure, not that the derivative of that, uh, that thing is a measure. You know, the, 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 I think you know, know what I'm talking, that when you, are you have the derivative of U, the dissipation of eta, derivative over K, the dissipation of eta K. And we don't know. So we know the set, we know everything, we can compute everything, but you know, the, 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 we cannot prove that the integral is bound. Okay, other question or remarks? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if not, let's try to ask it again.